Uh, so this is completely open Q&A today. Um, we don't have, we have one slide with all of our faces on it, so we can do brief intros so you know who you're talking about. Uh, we brought the Brain Trust to SharePoint and OneDrive here today to basically answer any questions you have. Uh, that from stuff you've seen today, uh, you know, questions about a feature maybe we're thinking of building, we can talk about it if we thought about it, uh, other things like that. Uh, I do have Dan Kogan here with me, who is definitely an expert, but has agreed to provide a slightly different role today, which is if we get a question that seems uh, maybe not appropriate for the whole audience, or uh, we want to follow up offline, he's there to sure, sort of take sure. your contact info, or to maybe we'll briefly address it, and then for more detailed stuff, if you're hungry for more, he can make sure you get the right the right resources. Uh, people at the mics already, which is awesome. That's the way we'll run it. I'll also be monitoring Twitter here. Uh, and you can, we have already have four or five questions submitted on that hashtag. You can feel free to go ahead and continue to submit more. Let's do uh, brief uh, intros here today. I'll start and we'll sort of pass it around. My name is Adam Harmetz. I've been working on SharePoint for 11 years. I'm the group program manager for the uh, team sites, portals, biz apps, and the developer platform. Um, and then Russ is my counterpart. I guess we'll not go in slide order. We'll go in order of chair seating. So Russ, why don't you introduce yourself? All right. I'm Russ Moore. I've uh, been at SharePoint for 15 plus years since before it was called SharePoint. I'm director of engineering for SharePoint Experience, including the mobile apps and the developer framework. Oh. Uh, hi, I'm Denise Trebona. I'm the design manager for SharePoint. Hi, I'm Navjot Work. I'm the group program manager on SharePoint and OneDrive. I work on the service, security, IT controls, and on-premise. Uh, hello, my name is Omar Shaheen. I've uh, been on OneDrive since 2010, so six years, and I'm a group program manager. I work on our mobile applications and our overall user experience for OneDrive and OneDrive for Business. Uh, I'm Kamal Janarthan. I'm a group program manager in Office 365 and work on security and compliance for SharePoint. It's all the things that are supposed to give you peace of mind. <laughs> I, um, I'm Naresh uh, Kannan. Uh, I've been in SharePoint since 1999. I'm the director of engineering for services and storage. Great. I don't think this works. So. <laughs> Almost. Uh, why don't we take a question from the back there? <laughs> okay. We heard so much this week about groups, about team sites, about camera groups, and as all of us are engaged in our organizations using them day to day, what should we be thinking of as coming out and hearing all of this announcement and this noise? And how should we plan for Great. it? And what should be our big all right, uh, so to repeat the question for those watching the live stream, it was about groups, the conceptual model, Yammer, team sites, lots of changes announced at this conference. Can we sort of, uh, can we get it clear? O Omar, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, great question. So um, the way I think about it is if you just take each workload in Office 365, each of them lets you collaborate and communicate with people. And so I can go to Outlook and I can create a new message and send it to people. I can go to OneDrive. I can. Um, share files with people. I can go to team site. I can set up you know, a set of permissions for a set of people, security groups, what have you. Um, I think the capability that uh, groups brings to you is a simple way to just provision or create a group with a list of people, um, typically a list of people that you're going to work with. Um, so less ad hoc collaboration, more um, structured collaboration around the set of individuals, whether it's a team or a part of a team or a cross-company uh, group of people. And the, the benefits are once you've done that, now you get a bunch of capabilities in every single, uh, every single part of Office 365. So in Outlook, you get a mailbox, uh, you get a calendar, uh, you get a member list of people that uh, administrators can add and remove from, uh, and you also get a team site. And the benefits of getting a team site are you get a file storage, you get to, a place to put files, so you don't have to worry about each person sharing individually from their OneDrives and nobody seeing a single view of all those files. Um, you can get a calendar, schedule meetings, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, planner, uh, Yammer. So every single workload benefiting from this um, simple way to just say, I want to work with a set of people. <coughs> Create as many groups as you want. Make it easy to communicate. Make it easy to navigate across the entire suite and do work. Um, and so I think fundamentally it's about empowering individuals to establish those um, groups however they want to do it. Um, and for all of the workloads in Office 365 to benefit from that. 
so that wherever you're working, um, you can easily uh, communicate and collaborate. And so I think that's how we think about the relationship. Um, and of course, with a SharePoint team site, you get much more than just uh, file storage. You get pages, news, publishing, workflow, a bunch of really fantastic capabilities that you can take advantage of. Um, if you don't need to, you just get a folder to put your files in, which I think a lot of uh, groups would benefit from. But of course, there's much, much more. Um, and then with our mobile applications, um, you get a simple way to access all your files with OneDrive. With a SharePoint mobile app, you get a really simple way to access all the sites in, in your company. Um, and then similarly for all the other mobile applications, uh, simple ways to connect with those people and exchange emails or, or files. Cool. Uh, I'll take a question from the front. We'll do one on Twitter and then we'll go to the back. Okay. Um, so I'm very excited to see all of the changes on the on line world that's happening and the mobile app in particular. So um, I'm in the hospital setting and we have a very diverse um, group of people, doctors, nurses, food workers. Um, and what we're trying to do is engage everybody because a lot of people aren't at a computer. So <clears throat> before we really didn't have anything um, that looked good on a lot of personal devices with the SharePoint. So this new mobile app looks really fantastic. So my question is around and I think you said that push notifications are something that are hopefully a feature that are going to be happening soon. So <clears throat> would we be able, perhaps through the SharePoint side, to do things like um, show them their PTO, show them like their calendar, their scheduling, and have them do sort of like time reporting in a different system, like a Kronos system? Russ, do you want to try to take a stab? you want me to talk a little? Take a stab that way. So you're sort of asking how do you connect line of business apps into SharePoint, and especially in, the, in a yeah. mobile lens? Yeah, would we be able to do that via SharePoint and then have that available to people on their personal devices wherever? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly our vision. You know, I think the industry sort of goes back and forth whether there should be one Uber app versus a bunch of point apps that you might want to use, right? So even if you integrate it with SharePoint, is there still a separate PTO app that somebody would boot? You saw Facebook sort of went with one app approach, and then they've been sort of putting their apps, there's a separate messenger app than a Facebook app now. So I, you know, I think it's sort of up to you to decide whether you want to try to do a one big app for, for everything or a bunch of apps that people would install. I think we're pretty supportive of either way. And SharePoint, uh, yes, we have been and will be a great place to aggregate line of business data together. And I think we're going on a journey to make that all mobile. And I think some of the work we've done with the SharePoint framework is a really cool, uh, lightweight, open source way where stuff like line of business apps can be integrated in. And Russ, you want to talk about SharePoint Framework a little bit and how it can be used to pull in external data? Well, I was going to add a couple things also. I also think Power Apps and Flow may really apply in this case, especially if you're talking about mobile and deskless workers. Both of them have an awesome you know, mobile experience. And what, you sort of tailor what you want to have show up for that deskless worker in that case. Um, in addition, SharePoint Framework, 100% responsive. You can build your app to do anything. It'll work for mobile. It'll work for the web. It'll work for the guy with the, the Surface as well. So I think you can get a good experience for all of those things, and we're doing a lot of work to pull that business data in to SharePoint Framework, be able to connect out directly from the client to different line of business apps and the like. So Yeah, the tagline for the app really is the internet in your pocket. And I think what the internet's always meant with bringing in process people and content all together um, will continue to be true. So w one question from Twitter, and then we'll go back to a, a mic in the back. So from Rich, uh, can specific file types or files containing sensitive data be blocked from upload in OneDrive? Uh, Kamal, Navjo, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about that? Kamal, you can. On? Okay. So by default, if you just want to, we don't block you from uploading any type of files into SharePoint or OneDrive. We do allow you to have policies around the content once it's in SharePoint and OneDrive. So the idea is, so if you, the question is very specific, can I block something? I think something? you should broaden it. We'll yeah. be politicians here. Exactly. <laughs> so if the question is specifically, can I up block it from uploading? No. But there's a reason. I mean, you have to be careful because your what kind of files people use and what file types they have, this is an ongoing thing. The, the corpus just keeps increasing. Our attitude towards this is a little different. Allow people to bring everything and then control policies. If the intent is to control sensitive documents, sure, we have a lot of stuff we can do to control sensitive documents. You can have policies around them. We help you classify. We help you identify. Come on, can maybe uh, uh, explain that a little more. But once we help you automate the whole process, you can discover them, you can classify them, and then you can set policies. You can decide who has access, who doesn't have access, can I share, can I view them, what kind of devices am I allowed to share them on, 
that's the direction we want to go, but we're not essentially considering blocking you from letting your users be productive. You want, if it's organizational data, you would prefer that it live in one place so you can actually have policies. Otherwise, you're just forcing your users to bifurcate the data. Yeah, no, and, and to add to what Navjo said, I think she described it well, our challenge with security and compliance is always, uh, you know, he who sacrifices uh, productivity for security deserves neither. So productivity is definitely always the, um, the, the focus. But the challenge that you have is that there are threats. So external malware coming in, and we've had for a while the scanning of contents. If anyone's heard of advanced threat protection, we effectively scan content coming into the service. And there is actually work right now underway to extend that to SharePoint. And to kind of highlight the point, the way we have to effectively thread the needle is, you can't have this scanning slow mechanism to ever bring data into the service, into, into SharePoint. But we do need to make sure that it isn't malware. So that's absolutely underway and sort of the cool effect of when you type in a URL or upload a file into SharePoint, being able to scan that and detonate that uh, invisibly to the end user and bring it into the service is sort of one place. And the second thing is, the place where we see sensitive data really kind of surface is, uh, for data coming in, it tends to be a malware or bad malicious. Sensitive data really surfaces with sending it out. So this is Sony, the attack, um, Snowden, just putting content out. And so there is effectively data loss prevention and data governance. So we announced um, preview for both Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, um, uh, data governance will effectively allow you to set a policy, as Navjo describes it, that says for certain data types, uh, we'll automatically notify you if it looks sensitive, if it's a credit card number and it's leaving your organization, or if it's sensitive data, and you can configure that specifically. So those are the ways that we see customers sort of allowing their end users to have as much productivity as they want, but keeping those boundaries in place to keep them safe. Cool, so we're getting lots of questions on Twitter, which is great. We'll do back, front, and one more Twitter question. So in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have two questions where the first question is multifolded. Uh, what is your roadmap with uh, VDI, non-persistent VDIs and one drives. Uh, again, what is the roadmap is first fold. The second one is, can I actually map a, a OneDrive user as a UNC path on a VDI for them to uh, use as my documents? And the, the second question is, uh, what do you guys do for, uh, recommend for huge migrations? We have about 70 terabytes of uh, my documents data. So what are the native migration tools that you guys give us? apart from the third parties that I know of, but. Great, Omar, Nemjo. Oh, so I'll take the first question, and then one of you guys can take the second one. So we get this question a lot, and the scenario is typically um, your employees are not actually using their own computers with their own data, they're terminal serving into another machine or using a virtual environment. Um, so the challenge with Sync is, Sync is a very stateless experience. The whole point of Sync is to connect to the cloud and pull down the content and have it available to you. It's a pretty, um, heavyweight way to make files available if what you're doing is you know, building up and tearing down sessions all the time. And so what we recommend for people who are using those types of scenarios, I'd say we have two recommendations. The first one is um, user browser experience, which is very capable now. It supports drag and drop upload. It supports you know, uploading folders and files and has really rich experiences for um, doing things completely in the browser, whether it's authoring or editing or collaborating. Um, the second solution would be with Windows 10 to use our Windows Universal application, which um, just shipped on desktop a couple months ago. And that provides uh, a really rich experience for managing and accessing files. Um, we are going to be releasing uh, site support as well as offline support for that application shortly. And so that will provide users with a pretty complete experience on the desktop. And so many of the same capabilities that we have um, on the phone, on Surface Hub, and HoloLens. Um, and so those are, right now, the solutions we can offer you in terms of how to get OneDrive experiences in environments that are not suitable or, or appropriate for running a sync client. Um, and so that's part one of your question. I think the other ones were migration advice and what for especially yeah. large, what's, when do we go third sure. party, when do we go first party? So um, one thing I would say, obviously, you're probably very well aware, you're not unique. We have many, many customers in the same boat. So we look at that very carefully. We have lots of people bringing lots of data, large volumes of data, both from on-premise deployments already they have or file shares that they're trying to migrate to the cloud. Um, we have support for migration APIs. So if you wanted to know what can you do natively what's in the product, we have migration APIs that you can use. You definitely need to write some tooling around it so you can actually understand the migration APIs help you um, 
interpret the data so you can figure out how to bring it to the cloud, but you do have to write some tools. If you have, um, we help you in the process, we help you do an assessment, we help you figure out what data you've got, what you can bring, what are the things you might have to uh, change so that it can actually be compatible with what we have online. Um, and we are thinking of actually shipping a first party tool but it, to handle simple cases. You should look at third party offerings if you have a really complicated um, setup or I would recommend you look at it for a subset of your data or subset of that is coming from really complicated <coughs> customizations you might have on premise. But if you don't have anything like that, you can look at our APIs and you can probably do something pretty simple, pretty easily. If all you're tra trying to do is move data from on-prem to the cloud or from file shares to the cloud, there are lots of, you can write very simple tools, not a problem. You want to add Nirash, does yeah. 70 terabytes scare you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I want to add a couple of things. One, uh, Microsoft has a fast track program, uh, which uh, basically states that if you have more than 150 seats, uh, your migration is taken care of by fast track, uh, completely assessment as well as all the document upload download for a uh, subset of the content that you have. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to add. The second is um, at any given time, we are uh, migrating hundreds of terabytes um, from various, various customers, uh, be it fast track or actually using the migration APIs um, or through third party, depending on what the scenario is. So uh, you mentioned you had 70 terabytes of ODB data. Uh, we don't consider that a large volume by any means. Mm -hmm. There we go. So cool. There's is actually it? a follow up with that. So can we do a UNC mapping of the yeah. OneDrive? Oh, yeah, I forgot to, to answer that. Doc. So um, I would really encourage you not to think of OneDrive as a file share in the cloud. It's not. It's a end to end experience. That sort of replicates cloud data on many, many different device types. And so, you know, products like OneDrive and Box and Dropbox and Google Drive do not provide that kind of, you know, drive mapping. And so the sync engine is the sort of solution for getting files on a device if they need to exist there, you know, in, in perpetuity or in sort of stateful way. And then I'd keep follow up with the other answers I gave for how to access stuff in a stateless way, which would be browser and uh, Windows Universal application. So in front, then we'll go to Twitter. The Twitter question will be a typical wedge issue we've gotten for a while, so it'll be a canonical one, but we'll go with this one right first. All right, thank you all for being here and answering our questions. I work in a tightly controlled environment. Uh, access control to SharePoint Online is controlled by an external system. <clears throat> Part of my job is to take the share out of SharePoint. Is there... <laughs> <clears throat> That's right to the point. Yes. <laughs> you should meet my customer. So is there continue, going to continue to be a controls in SharePoint Online to prevent users from sharing internally and bypassing access control and any plans to improve the experience there, letting them know that you can share with people who already have access, but you're, you can't grant people access? Okay. Yeah, def <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> definitely you, so uh, go. Definitely me. Uh, so... First, um, I would love to know why you, your customer is doing this. We should take it offline. We highly encourage you to keep sharing using SharePoint. Um, but we do give you controls. We give you a lot of sharing controls. We uh, actually demoed a few in the sessions that we had in the past. So you can control the level of sharing you have. You also have the level of access you're, you're granting users. You can control what they can do. So you can give them view-only access. You can give them um, owner access. They can invite others or they can't invite others. Um, you can actually, for sensitive documents specifically, we allow you to block all internal sharing as well if you want. Um, but if you've given somebody full control on the document, they're the owner, we don't let you block them from sharing that. Did you want I mean, to you know, we do have some scenarios yeah. at Microsoft where we have something similar. Like we have, a, we have a super confidential site, we have a tool that MSIT has developed that will prevent it from being a public group. And if it's changed Correct. to public, it'll yeah. change it back to private. So yeah. depending so I, on the scenario. Yeah. So what we do have is your ability to cr create, make groups private or public. And in that case, if you make something private, that only the people who are members of the group can see it and nobody else can discover the group or join the group. And they're not allowed to share with anybody outside the group. So. But within the group, those people definitely have ability to share with each other. Does so, that help? Yeah, the challenge is, so in SharePoint, we have, we move the permission to change permissions. 
Yes. So it seems that some of the sharing features are bypassing. We may need to follow up yeah. offline about I think, this. Yeah, and, we'll have you know, to, we do have yeah. new sharing UI. It's sort of more link-based. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Masner is sitting close to you, and he right. is mouthing answers to me right now. So <laughs> he uh, is probably a good person to maybe follow up offline um, and uh, make sure that that's taken care of. Yeah. But in, in that sense, final comments, we'll do a question from Twitter, which was, um, can we get a list view with more than 5,000 items? Uh, so we knew awesome. we'd get that. We have like three questions we'll know we'll get asked, and it's uh, 10 minutes in, so 15 awesome. minutes in. Um, I'll take that one. Great. Um, so uh, let me start off by actually stating a few facts. Uh, today in MSDN, uh, the limit on the number of list items in a list is 30 million. A lot of our customers have actually deployed document libraries and lists with many, many millions of items inside the list. So that's one. Um, the second is, where did this mythical uh, 5K limit come from? And what does it exactly mean? Um, so clearly, it's not the total number of items that can be stored inside a list. It is the total number of items that any end user can reason with in a given view. Um, and what that means is, if a list has 10 million items, we don't want the user to actually do a sorted view or a, you know, a filtered view spanning all the 10 million items. We want to actually reason over 5,000 items. And this is being done primarily for uh, end user experiences. Um, are we going to do something about it? Yes. We are working on actually uh, eliminating the 5K limit uh, and providing the right user experiences so that uh, the pages are still snappy. We haven't yet announced the dates for it. There is another aspect of a 5K limit that is thrown out, and that is sync clients. Uh, the old sync client was unable to actually uh, sync more than a certain number of files inside a document library uh, or a ODB. And after a certain uh, limit, uh, be it 5K or 15K or 20K, it used to degrade in performance. With the new sync client that has been rolled out with uh, ODB, there is no such limit. Um, and the new sync client, which actually is, um, I, I believe you announced the dates for SharePoint as well, will also not have any limits. She should just mic drop and walk out now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we do so, hope to be next year. I mean, that the work we want to do across the UX and the back end is complex. We don't have it on the roadmap yet. but. Uh, I'll just be blunt. Every time somebody at mentions Twitter, Jeff on Twitter about it, he sends us a mail. So probably shouldn't have mentioned that because now that's going to happen a lot more often. <laughs> uh, we, all, and we hardly need it because we do think it's top of mind for us. But we do have a user voice audio. It's on not really Jeff, you know. It's just the flow that he has <laughs> set up. There we go. <laughs> just send mail to you. <laughs> Damn it. He's, mm, he's, he's conniving. Um, but we do have a user voice item on this. We hardly need more votes on it because I think it's top of mind. But if you are passionate, go ahead and spend some of your votes on that one. Um, and uh, we'll go back, uh, Twitter, and then front again. Hi. Um, my question, which I admit may be uh, based on old information, but with uh, Office uh, 365 groups generating a SharePoint site and that site not being visible, at least in the SharePoint admin console, is there any hope of yep. giving us the ability to administer over these things? Do you want to talk to it? Do you want me yeah, so, you know, big announcement this week that uh, uh, Office 365 groups get a full team site. Uh, and so there's no compromise. doesn't really matter which one you create. So that's great. But, yeah, if you do go to the admin console in SharePoint, they don't, they don't show up there. Um, there's some technical reasons for that. There's also some really good reasons where, you know, Jeremy Masner talked in his team site talk. Uh, for the most part, we really want to try to manage groups centrally. That's the feedback we've been getting from folks. Um, uh, that uh, you know, rather than manage a separate object, a lot of the operations you might want to do, you want to do on a group, and then that sort of percolates down to the mailbox, the team site, and the planner. Uh, that being said, I do think we have work planned to make these available. I don't. Does anybody know specifics on uh, Jeremy? Jeremy might have. You should just. Have, we should uh, next time we'll include you. What was that? <laughs> just talk. Uh, uh, yell, yell loud. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, group lifetime, create and delete, group ownership and group membership is all controlled through the AAD portal and 
PowerShell. You can go there. You can delete your group, undelete it. That all impacts the site collection. If you use the SharePoint Online PowerShell, there are two specific SharePoint capabilities you can set, which is storage quota and sharing capability. And the question, do you think we'll ever evolve that? Do you think in the admin for the, when you're listing the site collections, we'll show groups, group site collections, or is not, not, that not the plan right now? Yes, the plan is for the, for the admin. But okay. again, we'll be limited. We, we don't want to be in a world where you go to SharePoint and delete the site out from under a group, mm -hmm. because then you confuse the whole rest of the world. So, so we'll fix it, we'll put it in the gallery, but we won't necessarily have every single option you can do, especially options that would be unsafe. I was just curious because we end up having, for example, we just migrated to the cloud, uh, 300 some odd sites and our users are so interested in it that they created groups with the same name as the site that we were trying to generate you know trying to migrate yeah. Yeah, no, and of course we can't there. do anything about it yeah and i mean this is on plug session there are some technical reasons why we have a separate list of sites sort of outside of the sharepoint farm that we've been using for that and that's something we're rationalizing so there's a little bit of technical rationalization to do do one, one Twitter question then up front. So uh, a question of any chance for site-wide breadcrumb navigation. Um, and I think we'll, uh, there's some, a plus one on that type of thing. Denise, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about maybe future plans for nav, what you've heard and, and thoughts there? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. That's a comment I've heard from a few of our customers. Uh, I'll say at the moment we're looking at uh, rationalizing a lot of different forms and styles of navigation that, that people use because each situation seems to be a bit custom. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll look exactly at the same system as we had previously with the breadcrumb, but we're really, really focused on making sure that people can way find around SharePoint, find the way to the sites that they use frequently, find their way to the sites that are federated and related to the, to the site they're currently on. Um, and, and just working through all of the different levels of navigation we need to think about. Yeah, so it is top of mind for us, both intra-site, cross-site, and then within sort of sites with subweb as well. In front. Uh, thank you for, thank you for uh, doing all that you do. And my question's about the uh, next-gen sync client. So the situation that I, that I have is one of my end users installs a sync engine on their machine at home, they sync their OneDrive uh, for business files there, and they get the ransomware virus, and uh, all their files start to encrypt and upload. Mm -hmm. um, are, do you guys have any safeguards behind the curtain to guard against like mass encryption or? Uh, <laughs> actually, you're not the first one to ask this question this week. Uh, it is very top of mind for us. We take it very, very seriously. Um, we have a few tools that are at your disposal if this happens. Are, um, you can do, we have versioning online and we allow you to roll back. So if you just, yeah. Uh, you know, versioning works great when you're editing the files, but what if they're like pictures and PDFs and those kind of things that you're just for reference? Yes. So you can roll back. We allow you to roll back uh, folders. So what? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So we are versioning for every file. So if you know the timestamp, you just need to know what time you want to go back to even if you don't want to open the file. You can roll back any file. You can roll back a folder. And if you know, you're a large organization and let's say something really terrible happens and you're in a situation where your entire uh, tenant, something like this happens, it's more than something that you can handle on your own through UX that an individual can roll back or an admin can roll back. You can call support. We have the ability, our service is super secure. We have the ability to roll back your entire tenant for you if need be. Okay, so um, if someone has thousands of files, um, you have to go one by one by one, or is there? You can roll mass? back folders. Okay, mm -hmm. you could roll back folders. Yes. I didn't know that, awesome. So um, uh, in line with uh, the OneDrive sync engine, um, let's say you have you know an HR person, business person, they've got their even their corporate laptop or their home laptop and they sync their OneDrive file or SharePoint and their machine gets stolen but then the files are on the machine yes is is there any particular shielding on that on those files sure. Sure. You know? so I think um, so Navjo effectively described what you do from the SharePoint client perspective, but one of the things that across uh, Windows as well as Office is um, building EDP, 
if you've heard of it. So Windows Information Protection, what it effectively does is um, there's a product called EMS, or Enterprise Mobility Services, and what we do is effectively the content on your drive is encrypted if you're a domain joined machine. So if this is a domain joined machine, one of the first things you can do is, very simply, you'll be revoking access to any file that is on that device. So the content is encrypted, the file's encrypted, and you can do this from the Windows Security Center. Now, it would be ideal if we had one policy across everything to do that in progress, but yeah, but, please. But I, mean, I mean in the case that the machine's stolen and it's offline. And then people go to, you can go to work on it and gain access to almost everything on there. Yes, true, but when you, so one of the things that EDP has done on the desktop, or on the, the device itself, is that when you actually try to access the content, there is a, um, and we've had this in OA for a while, there's effectively limited access on that device. So if you aren't able to connect to the network, there's sensitive content, there's a set of granular policies for certain types of data, where you can't get access to it unless you're online. And the moment you're online, it's revoked. And we've had this with, um, on uh, the, the iPhone, for example, Office, for a while, it's just something that we've now made standard across. And as I said, the policy configuration is still separate, but it is something we're working on to kind of tie it back to. Um. Yeah, I think the question is, I would say, to make it a little broad, you're worried about managing your data on users' devices, and whether it's you've synced it or you have our apps, mm -hmm. you should look at uh, managing your devices. And if, in your case, this is, is sync, so most likely it's a managed device if the user is able to sync it down. Yeah you should have management policies that control what kind of, what the device should do if they're bringing down any data from OneDrive or SharePoint. So on a Windows device, it would be great for you to turn on BitLocker, make sure it's a fully managed device, you have policies you can apply, you can have, apply group policies. Similarly, we highly encourage you, if you're using our mobile apps on users' devices, managed or unmanaged, use Intune to actually set management policies for our apps. So you can use Intune and you can actually uh, encrypt the data on the device. You can remote wipe, correct, all the data that the apps have. You can revoke access completely. So that way, even if your device gets lost, it's not a big deal because your data is always protected. Cool. So we have Thank lots you. of controls for you across the spectrum of devices you have, managed or unmanaged. Do you want to briefly talk about the security white paper that came out too, maybe as a yes. holistic resource? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Adam. Um, we just I'm published a security white paper. Um, and there's a short URL, which I've memorized now, aka.ms slash SPO security. And highly encourage you to go read that. It gives you a broad view of all the security controls we have and how we keep your data safe in SharePoint and OneDrive. And it specifically talks about access from devices and apps and managed and unmanaged devices, different locations, and all the things we do in the service to keep your data safe. So highly encourage you to take a look at it. OK, we'll go back. Say it again slowly, please. It's, oh, yeah. sorry. AKA.ms slash SPO security. We'll go back, we'll go Twitter, and then front. The guy totally stole my question. Uh, <laughs> Make up a new one. <laughs> yep, I got a follow-up one for you guys. Um, is there a way to restore that data that's been compromised like post 30 days in SharePoint Online and OneDrive? So the, the farthest we can go back in time and point in time restore, is that what you're asking? Yeah. So you have the ability to roll back 30 days in the recycle bin. Um, like I said, if something really terrible happens, open a support call. We have ability to do more. That's probably all I can say about it. <laughs> we also have Zach Rosenfield here. Maybe you guys can chat offline a little bit. He's, he uh, deals with these on a daily basis and uh, works for Navjet in the storage thing too. He's mouthing answers as well. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I will, this is a plug for uh, Zach's talk. Zach has a talk at 3 o'clock. If you want to know how we actually run the service and a whole bunch of questions of this kind of how the service keeps your data and how we run it at scale, Zach has a session at three. I highly encourage you to attend that. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. A question from Twitter from Tim. Uh, can you talk about the process of existing team sites being provisioned with the 365 group and the timeline? So we announced today when you create a new group or a new team site, you get a full one-to-one -one alignment. But there's obviously a lot of customers with existing team sites out there, and they want to be able to associate with the group. Um, I can answer a little bit, but Denise and Russ, if you wanted to talk about it. So what we have done is all new groups. Groups will automatically get team sites. We haven't done the opposite, which is team sites automatically get groups. If you go through new provisioning, that will happen. The challenge is that existing team sites have all sorts of complicated security permissions and other types of settings that are there that don't automatically uh, map well to a group. So what we've done is going forward, when you create a new group, 
uh, or a new team site, you will get a group by default, especially if you create it through the team site home, but not the other way around. Um, we are looking at addressing it over the next year. We don't quite know how. We actually yeah. built and did, decided not to ship a feature that would link a second team site to the group. Uh, you know, you'd have your primary one, that's where the docs go, but, and we wanted to try to, but we didn't really love it and it sort of added more confusion than the problems it solved. So we're you know, actively soliciting <laughs> ideas for how people would like to solve this problem right now, I think. Um, yeah. You know, the linking, maybe some even lighter form might do it. But, you know, there's a lot of things that are wired up by default to a group. For instance, File Explorer today pretty much relies on a very different model um, that's been with us a lot longer for how files get previewed and work. And so I think we really, as Russ said, invested in making the browser experience as capable. Um, that doesn't mean we don't believe in File Explorer integration. That's why we have a sync client. That's why we are investing so deeply uh, and making the sync experience com you know, completely reliable and great. So I think between those two, you know, the open and explore thing fall falls right in the middle. Um, and we're trying to get out of the middle on some of these things. And this exactly. has been an issue for you. I do think we've made a lot of progress recently, especially with the modern UX, to have bulk upload of folders moving around. Like some of the uh, canonical reasons people were using it are going away. In addition, rock solid sync, of course, for team sites helps as well. I don't know which of you got here first, um, back and then front. Go ahead. So for the first time, you guys are actually running a little bit behind what I've been doing for the last couple of years. I don't think that I've seen that happen before. <laughs> but what we've been doing is um, we actually, this is shameful, we don't use Active Directory groups. My university has just discovered that ignoring them for the last 20 years is actually a problem. And so they're working on rectifying it. I figure it would be about two years before I can actually use something resembling a group, security group, in SharePoint. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we've built everything out the hard way using SharePoint groups. So I make my users edit by hand. <laughs> okay. So what we use it for is communication. So we build a site, we've got an announcement, I build a two-line workflow, and this is how they announce to their students on that floor in that dorm, for instance. There are 75 groups running our residence life communications with our students that live on campus right now, for instance. Um, with the switch to Exchange versus SMS for email, that was fabulous. I could have much shorter workflows, I thought. The problem I've run into is I'm still hitting a limit of about 150, even though we're sending it out through Exchange instead. And I've proven the 150 limit, and I've actually managed to hang up at least two of your product teams, so sorry about that part. 100, but, 150 <laughs> members in a SharePoint group? 150, and what happens is I get, we get a bad recipient message, which isn't true. It's actually hung mm. up on the number, and so the workflow just runs, and you will get hundreds of copies if I can't find it and get that workflow stopped. So I'm getting bad messages and bad reactions back in SharePoint from my workflow when it hits mm. an error when it's talking back and forth to exchange itself. So my question is actually, <laughs> um, are you continuing work on getting some of these things worked out? Is this something where I should just walk away, turn on flow, and try to replace the dozens of workflows that I've got that are doing something similar? Most of them are for much smaller groups, so I only run into this with more than 150 members in a group. Um, yeah. Should I just walk away, use Flows, do a Power App, do something else, right. and give up? Because I've, I've got a ways to go before we're going to be able to use yeah. any kind of distribution group. I, mean, I think we should probably follow up offline on the specifics. <laughs> I'd like to make sure you're um, exactly. as set up as best as possible. Uh, generically, from a strategy perspective, certainly our go-forward investments are in Flow and in exchange for group management. Sure. And that's where you'll see the go-forward investments. It's unlikely for us to increase the scale limits of SharePoint groups or anything like that. Um, you know, we are actively looking at the, the uh, we've seen a huge increase in the use of traditional SharePoint workflows uh, over the past couple months, driven a little bit by some partners like Nintex and others. And so we are looking at some uh, work we can do to improve the reliability of that investment, that type of thing. But pretty much, uh, I think we've been clear on our go-forward strategy of power apps flow exchange for groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd love to see if you can get the most out of the existing system that we can follow up offline. Either find Dan, he can take your info, or we can come up afterwards, get one of our cards. Thank you. And do that. Sure, of course. In front. My question's about the um, group, the uh, Graph API versus the SharePoint API set. Is the plan to unify th those two into one? Russ? 
What was, can you repeat the question? So you've got the graph APIs mm -hmm. and you've got the SharePoint APIs. Yep. Is the plan to unify them all under graph API or? Yeah, our, our long-term plan is to move, is to make everything available under the graph API. Today uh -huh. that's not true. We still support yeah. a lot of things through CSOM and through other APIs, the old REST APIs. Um, but over time, yes, we'll start to expose everything over graph. And, and um, the SharePoint APIs, right? It won't be a either or. It won't exactly. be SharePoint, and then the graph will be something on top of the SharePoint API. So yeah, we're not we're not deprecating those in any time that I you know in the foreseeable future. Okay. And are you still developing the SharePoint APIs? We still add mm -hmm. things to see some now absolutely. and then, certainly, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but that said, going forward, we're going to move more and more things to graph, and that will be our our long term strategy. Right. Graph okay. is certainly good, especially if you're doing cross-service calls. But sometimes if you're just writing an app within SharePoint, not calling any other service, I think the SharePoint APIs may just be easy and faster for you as yeah. well. Oh. So we have two minutes left. I don't see anybody at the mics. Uh, we have a touchy-feely question on Twitter. Um, so I, we could end on a touchy-feely question, or we could take, let's, let's take the hard question, and maybe we'll, we'll end on the touchy-feely one more. Go ahead. Great. So thank you so much for being here. Um, my question's really about sync. And I want to know why I should care about sync. I have users that I never taught them to work in document libraries through File Explorer. So why would I do the same with OneDrive? Meaning, why can't we work from the cloud? Why would I, we have to go bring it down to my desktop, go in File Explorer, and work that way, as opposed to work kind of in an environment now where we're always online. So why would we try to teach them to do a different way or show a sync button that perhaps I don't want them to push? Because that's just going to cause more questions for them. That's, a, that's actually a really good question. Um, you don't need to care about sync. I mean, sync exists because of the vast number of people in the universe that grew up using Windows Explorer and Finder and have local files and have Adobe Acrobat and you know, uh, all this rich ecosystem of applications that only know how to talk to local files. And so you can think of sync as a translator between the cloud and the PC um, in terms of creating that cloud experience as best it can in a very sort of constrained environment. And so it turns out that's actually one of the hardest engineering things that we do is actually you know, sync is all edge cases. It's like 99% of the work is dealing with the edge cases of rep, recreate, uh, recreating data in the cloud, putting it on the device, and then supporting shared collaborative experiences where two people can have the exact same folder on their PC and then see all the changes going back and forth. So for a lot of customers, they really care about that because that's a, an enabler for a lot of scenarios and solutions. But that doesn't mean it's necessary. There's plenty of corporations and universities and students where, or sc uh, schools where kids are growing up with mobile devices and the web, and things just not necessary, and it's not important. And you can absolutely author a Word document and share it and print it, and uh, you know convert it to PDF coming shortly. Or you know, it, it's there's a lot you can do in the cloud now without having to interact in File Explorer. And for a lot of people, that complexity of the past is is unhelpful and unnecessary. And so, we're not telling you to go and uh, care about sync. Um, and in fact, we give you the ability to take the sync button out of the product so that people don't click it, don't see it, don't need to know about it. So I think it's up to you to decide how you want to deliver an Anywhere Access story to your customers. And you can do that through our mobile apps, you can do that through our browser, you can do it through our sync engine, um, and I think you kind of have the choice is what it comes down to. Okay, La last question and then maybe a quick wrap-up thing as well. Well, it's not really a question. Okay. I've been uh, walking for the last couple of days to sessions, going around the booths, asking questions, and I think uh, this needs to be done a little more. I think I, I thought I had a lot of questions answered, and every question that I was asked here was great, and because uh, I'm taking this back to the uh, corporate okay. and, uh, you know, diving deep, deep into this. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, thank uh, you. Yeah, please. Cool. And please do give us feedback on the feedback tool on this session if you really liked it. Uh, well, really quick roundtable for one question that's up uh, on here. Uh, what new feature or tool are you most proud of from the past year or excited about and how has it changed the way you worked? Uh, so really, or just a really quick roundtable, one from maybe from each of us and then we'll, we'll call, it, call it good. I know Naresh is excited about. What is it? Uh, file activity, insights. Actually it is, it is. I'm super excited. <laughs> 
Softball pitch. Oh, yeah. So well, it's all you talk to me about anymore. I, I think yeah. I'm going to talk about it for the next two hours, but uh, to respect your time. Um, so, quick, quick, quick. Over the course of the last year, we've been actually putting a lot of energy into uh, figuring out analytics and insights around what people do around a document and so on, and how to actually present that data and add value. So, I thought this is one of the most innovative areas. And uh, in the fullness of time, I expect intelligent uh, AI-based uh, analytics and insights that will actually show up in documents. Super excited about this space. Once again, just mic drop and walk out. <laughs> Come on, real quick. Well, I think this is, um, this is a bit of a theme at uh, Ignite this year was about the intelligence. So one of the, um, I think the coolest things that we saw in Kirk Kay's demo, and Satya actually referenced this, was uh, people are sort of wringing their hands about what kind of policy do I put in the service? How do I keep my service secure? And so one of the first things we introduced this time was effectively the ability to look at your tenant, look at your data, sensitive data, non-sensitive data, look at your geography, your vertical information you give us, and most importantly, look at the community of the Office 365 ecosystem and make recommendations to you on what security and compliance you should have. And that's just something that you have to put together with duct tape in your own little silo on premises. It's something the cloud enables. So that, that's what we announced. I'm super excited about that. Omar? I'm excited when the rush is excited because it means my job is a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think the whole idea of um, doing stuff for you. And so today, putting files in the cloud, not much happens after you do that. I think we have so much opportunity to help you understand like I upload a bunch of pictures, we figure out they were taken at Ignite, a bunch of receipts, I can you know, easily submit them later on in my expense report tool, pictures of my kids on the weekend, I get an album I can share with people. That whole theme of, I don't have the time to look at all my photos and my documents and figure out what folders to put them in. I want, I want something else to do that for me. And so I think we have a huge opportunity um, to give people insights, to help them get stuff done, to spend less time managing their stuff. This is a trick question because you have to pick one. Um, I have to say I, like, I love the new SharePoint Home. Uh, it's actually changed the way I work. I don't really, to what Denise was saying, I don't rely on breadcrumbs anymore. I always know what I'm working on. I can always find it quickly. I also know what everybody else is working on. So this, I just feel very liberated. And now it's on the phone. I just, it's just changed the way I work completely. All the sites I want, I know exactly what they are. They're always one click away. I'm never searching for it. I never go back and look for links sent to me in email. When somebody sends something, it's always there. So it's just changed the way I work. Cool. Denise? Yeah, you just kind of landed that for me. Thanks. It's awesome. <laughs> I was having to think and think, am I going to pick SharePoint Home? Am I going to pick mobile? Um, so that's covered. So I guess uh, I'll talk about news, I think, is my oh, favorite. That was mine. <laughs> New feature. That's what you get for being yeah, at the end. I know, right? Yeah. Um, but no, I'm really, really excited for Team News, which we have talked a lot about this week. Um, I heard that session earlier today was super well attended. Uh, I think it's really going to allow people to connect more with content, uh, showcase their content more uh, with their team members, and then kind of uh, get it distributed, get it further distributed around the company. So I'm super excited about where that's going to go. I'm going to cheat, sorry, and <laughs> take two features, because I, I want to echo, I love SharePoint Home, and I also love the news and all the stuff, the stuff we've done there, and the SharePoint mobile app, which is sort of the mobile representation of SharePoint Home. But as a developer guy, I really love the SharePoint framework, and the reason I really love the new SharePoint framework is it allows my developers to actually build all these features like news a lot faster and increase our productivity, especially if we embrace open source, the new fabric, and a lot of the other things, and that's been huge for me and my team. So I have to pick that too. Cool. Uh, you know, I, I chat about this in some of my talks, but I'll, I'll choose Flow and Power Apps. Um, you know, when I joined SharePoint 11 years ago, there was just a bunch of excitement from heroes in your team or power users that wanted to be heroes to their team members that really sort of wanted to go beyond just the surface level of technology and get the most out of it. And in my 11 years, the things that most reminded me of that first time when I joined SharePoint and saw how people got excited is this virtuous cycle between flow for process, power apps for creating apps, and then SharePoint for managing it all. Uh, and I, we're just getting started there, but I think that's a, a huge opportunity for the entire company and for all of us as, uh, who use this every day. Um, so that's that. So thank you all. We're up here for any other additional questions. We'll try to answer some stuff on Twitter that maybe didn't get answered. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.